This is Timeless Leadership, where we explore what makes extraordinary people tick. We look for the universal truths that will help make us better versions of ourselves. Hi, it's Scott Monty, and welcome back to Timeless Leadership. This is one of those episodes where we're in between interviews, and I thought I'd just have a chat with you, directly with you. And it's going to be about a topic related to the last interview, the one I did with Laura Gassner Otting about her book, Wonder Hell. And it really has to do with wondering uh, exactly how we define success. So uh, you'll want to stay tuned for that. But before I do that, I wanted to remind you that you can interact with me here. You can send in questions, comments, feedback, anything you like to timelesspod at scottmonte.com. That's timelesspod at scottmonte.com. And we did have some listener mail regarding um, a question It was a specific question that Victoria wrote to ask about. She said, hey, I just wanted to let you know a key issue I've had concerning leadership. The issue, I believe, is best explained using a roundabout example. The leader of a team is tasked with finding the best solution to a company problem. The leader takes into account many ideas from team members, and eventually the team leader must eliminate ideas, whether fully or partially. And it's highly likely that the best solution is an amalgamation of the many ideas. My fear is that the rejection of ideas in this sense will lead the owners of these ideas to distrust me as a leader. I'm afraid this will create a divide and more. Excuse me. I'm afraid that this will create a divide and more than that, I'm afraid that choosing my one over the other will lead to a lower work efficiency in the future. I look forward to your response and insights. Many thanks, Victoria. Well, Victoria, that is not an uncommon issue where you're concerned with alienating people whose ideas aren't selected. I completely understand. And you've asked people to be generous with their ideas And in the process, you're causing them, maybe asking them to be vulnerable in the process. And you don't want them to feel as if their contributions weren't important. And I think in this case, it's helpful for people to understand the process, to understand your thinking, right? How you went through it, why it was difficult for you, and ultimately how you came to your decision. And in doing so, you actually open yourself up to vulnerability as well, because you're letting people on the inside, letting them know how you do your work. But the good news is, even if they don't agree with your process or agree with the outcome, they can at least start to relate to you. And that's the goal in any good business relationship or leadership position is to build trust by building relationships and ultimately inspiring them to become the best contributors they can be. If you've got a leadership communication or just human behavior question or observation or something you want to get off your chest, just email me. Again, the email address is TimelessPod at scottmonte.com. So I wanted to talk to you a little more in depth about how we define our success, because it's going to be different for everyone. What makes me feel successful might not be the same thing that makes you feel successful. And we put an awful lot of stock on what the world around us has to say about defining success. You know, I recently posted a picture of an Elon Musk inspired cologne that was at some TechCrunch conference. 
Uh, it was Elon's musk. And I asked people what it would smell like. And <laughs> as you can imagine, the responses were all over the place. But one person said success. And I thought, well, that's interesting because here success uh, is defined perhaps by being the richest man in the world, uh, perhaps by having technology that positively and negatively affects lives of people all over the world. But is that really the end all and be all of success, those outward projections of our accomplishments? And a lot of times we try to compare ourselves to other people in those positions. And we perhaps tell ourselves that there are certain thresholds that we need to meet in order to consider ourselves successful. For example, uh, if only I had a better salary, I'd feel secure. If only I had a bigger house, I'd be content. If only I got that promotion, I'd be happier. If only, if only. And we seem to predicate how we feel and how we live our lives based on tangibles and outcomes. As if there was some end goal, some final state of being that we could attain if we possessed or passed a level, you know, kind of like unlocking a level of a video game. And our brains tell us if only we got what we wanted, then we'd be happy that a change in our circumstances would make us satisfied. Now think about that for a moment. If you have desires, more money, a different house, different job, vacation, an ice cream cone, a glass of single malt whiskey. Does that keep you happy and satisfied? Likely not. I mean, it'll change your circumstances briefly, but after you reach that level, after you consume that item, then you're back to saying, if only again. Lori Santos is a professor at Yale University, and she teaches a course called Psychology and the Good Life. And she observed that a primary takeaway is that happiness is a mindset to be cultivated, not a condition to be imposed. Again, a mindset to be cultivated, not a condition to be imposed. In other words, it's not about external forces or the stuff you own or the way society judges. It's about the habits that you have or that you take that lead to sustained satisfaction. What might some of those habits be? Well, you could put more effort into relationships, relationships with family and friends. You could practice gratitude. G.K. Chesterton wrote that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Mm. I love that. You can live in the present, speaking of wonder, and take the time to observe the world around you and appreciate the things that make you smile. The little things. And... I mean, we're surrounded by little things every day, things that might escape our notice if we're not paying attention, if we're heads down, buried in that phone. And when we practice a little reflection, we can extract so much more out of these little things than simply passing them over. A few years ago, I posted something on Facebook that really made me reframe how I look at things. I asked my friends to share a fond memory of us. And as you know, the way the algorithms work on the social platforms, we don't see 100% of the posts that our friends make. And, you know, particularly when you've overfriended or overfollowed, people are, well, they're at risk of not showing up in your feed at all. So, I asked my friends, if you're reading this, even if we barely talk, leave a comment with a fond memory of us. And I was really taken aback, not just by the volume 
of comments. There were around 300, I think, including friends from a long time ago. But it was the caliber of the responses that stuck with me. Again and again, I came across comments that were about little moments. Moments that in some cases I probably don't even remember. But these were moments that stood out in people's minds. Maybe it was a note that I sent them, a remark that I made, uh, maybe a laugh that we shared together. Things that frankly didn't seem like a big deal to me at the time, but they mattered to my friends. And they mattered so much that years later, these memories were sparked for them. It reminded me of Clarence the Angel and George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. As I was greeted with a multitude of these small interactions that added up to a great deal. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? It's the little things. The true power of leadership isn't how many people you can fire or how profitable or successful you make a company or the number of hours you spend working. Those things won't be on your tombstone. True leadership is found in everyday words and actions, the way you treat every person you meet. Speeches and official communications will fade from memory, but your small gestures of kindness and inspiration, those are the things that are going to remain with people forever. One last story about little gestures. One of my fondest moments of working at Ford Motor Company was take your child to work day in 2013, 10 years ago. I brought my two sons, Will and Drew, with me for the day. They were 10 and 7 respectively. And one of the events was a presentation in this huge auditorium filled with Ford employees and their kids. And Alan Mullally, the CEO of Ford, was giving a presentation. When he finished with this presentation, he asked for questions from the audience. And my older son, Will, put his hand up and there wasn't time to take his question. But we got back to Ford World Headquarters and I took the boys to the cafeteria for their favorite hot dogs and tater tots. That's what they always liked to eat when they visited me at the headquarters. And as we were leaving the cafeteria, my phone rang. And it was Amy, who I knew as Alan's executive assistant. She said, Scott, where are you? I'm just downstairs outside the cafeteria. Well, can you come up to Alan's office, please? Okay, well, as much as I visited the 12th floor, which was just two floors above my own office, and I regularly interacted with Alan around the building and meetings at events, etc., I didn't really know what to expect this time around. When we arrived, Alan was waiting in the doorway to his office. We were kind of in the ante uh, room in Amy's space before we got to Alan's office, and he was back there in his doorway. And he had a big smile on his face. I said, Come on back, guys. And he chatted with Will and Drew for a little bit. He asked them about school, inquired about their day, and then even asked them their mom's name. And he sat down and wrote a note to my wife on Ford letterhead telling her what fine boys she had and how proud she must be. And then he drew his signature heart around Ford plus Monty family. And he gave the boys the piece of paper. And then he asked if we'd like a picture, and he invited us all behind his desk, had the boys sit in his chair. And then he motioned to Amy, who brought in two bags of Ford goodies, just Hot Wheels, pens, keychains, notepads, other tchotchkes, and he sent the boys on their way. Well, this still 
stands out in my mind as one of the finest examples of servant leadership that I've ever witnessed. Alan took note of us in the audience, and even though he couldn't answer Will's question, he followed up with this meaningful personal experience. Now, were there other executives whose kids' questions didn't get answered that day? Probably. Did they get an invitation to go up to Alan's office like we did? Hmm, possibly. But the thing is, even if they did, I guarantee you that Alan made them feel just as special as he made us feel. Because that's the kind of leader he was and is. And I hope that's the kind of leaders that my kids grow up to be. Meanwhile, I'm still spending as much time with them before they head out on their own. If only we could stay like this forever. If only. I want to thank you for being here as part of the Timeless Leadership Podcast. We'll be back again in the next episode with another interview. Looking forward to it, sharing it with you. In the meantime, just a reminder, you can reach out at TimelessPod at ScottMonte.com. Drop me an email with any thoughts you have. And we're also looking for sponsors. I've got a link to sponsorship opportunities in the show notes, so just take a look there. If it's right for you or your brand, let's chat and let's create something wonderful together. I hope that in the week ahead, your actions inspire others to learn more, dream more, do more, and become more. For that is the definition of leadership. I'm Scott Monty. Thanks, and I'll see you on the internet. <laughs>